The good Samaritan is Jesus and he tells the church, take care of this wounded man and I will come back until then care. What is the church on earth? The church is a hospital for sinners, not a museum of saints. Everything that could go wrong went wrong in the life of this young woman. When she was five years old, her father, who was a pastor, committed suicide. That devastated her and it brought a deep anger in her against God and she grew up with that anger. At the age of 13, she deliberately began to sin. She was so hard and angry with God that she committed every possible sin. She began to work in bars and she began to smoke and drink and take drugs and went into a party life. Later, she admitted she got no joy out of it, but she just did it. It was all a facade, a pretense. After 20 years of spending life like this, in every sin and all kinds of abuse, one night after an all-night party, when she woke up in the morning, she suddenly felt that she was going to die. Has any of you ever had the feeling that death is approaching? When you have the feeling of the onset of death and you're not ready for it, it is horrifying. And she knew she was not prepared for it. She knew she was going to die and she knew she was not ready. At that moment, the only thought in her head was, I need God. I need God. I need to get back to God. And the only place where she would find God, she knew, was church. Her desire to get back to church was so big that not one of her sins could stop her. She committed big sins, but the sense of shame and guilt, nothing was big enough. Nothing was big enough to stop her from going back to church. There were many demons who had held her captive. They were holding her back. But her desire to go to church was even more powerful than all these demons. Satan couldn't stop her. Her desperation, her desire to go back to church was so big, nothing could stop her except one thing. There was something bigger than her sin, something bigger than the devil that prevented her from going back to church. What could that be? May God speak to us today through this message. It's a message about repentance. We all know what repentance is, and yet we don't know everything. May God therefore enlighten us. May the Holy Spirit do a work in us through this message. Repentance is a positive word. When I cross over Jordan, and my work here is done Let my torch still be shining When my race I have run When I see my beloved I shall have no more fear I will lean on his shoulder I won't hold back my tears I will lean on his shoulder I won't hold when I cross over Jordan, Father, we pray that you may truly do a work in our hearts and all those who are listening today. 
Holy Spirit, enlighten us. It's not the skill and the presentation that really opens the eyes. Oh, Holy Spirit, you work through this word in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like you to draw your attention this morning to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9. And please read verse 17, first in the King James Version, and a little later we will look at it in the New Living Translation. Matthew 9, 17. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottles break, and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. Now I'm sure none of us understands this, because it makes no sense. If you pour new wine into an old bottle, why would the bottle break? It wouldn't. This doesn't make sense to us because we are not reading it in its cultural context. This was written about 2,000 years ago. And back in those days, bottles in Eastern nations were made of skins of animals. When they killed the animal, they would actually take out the whole animal from its skin, remove the skin very carefully, and then they would turn that skin into a leather pouch. They were known as wine skins. Now, wine skins were very convenient in those days, especially because they had to cross deserts. It was easier to throw a wine skin across the back of a camel than put a glass bottle on its back. So wine skins were very convenient, but the wine skin had a problem. You see, as time went on, the wine skin would become tender. And this was because the older they are, they would expand. Wine skins would expand. Imagine a balloon. We have all blown balloons. What happens when you blow air into a balloon? It expands. But what happens when it expands? Its skin becomes thinner and thinner and thinner. And you know there's a limit. Now, wine skins would expand and expand, but then they would reach a limit. So by the time a wine skin becomes old, it has reached its maximum expansion. If you then pour new unfermented wine inside that wine, old wine skin, it would cause the skin to swell and burst open. And that is why new wine skins had to be used because they had the elasticity to handle the pressure of new wine. If you now read in the New Living Translation, you'll see how clear it is. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, for the old skins would burst from pressure, spilling the wine and ruining the skins. New wine is stored in new wineskins so that both are preserved. Do you all get the picture now? New wine must be poured into new wineskin. So what is Jesus trying to say here? Jesus is comparing the gospel of God's grace to new wine. Something that we know about God's kingdom is that everything in God's kingdom is new. The places in, in the kingdom of God, what are they called? New earth, new heaven, new Jerusalem. Why? Why is heaven referred to? As new, because there's a verse in the Revelation. What does it say? Behold, all things, everything is new. I haven't been there, but I understand the meaning of new. It's not just new, but it is fresh, which means every day. I know I'm saying the wrong thing. Every day in heaven, because there's no night. But all the time is this feeling it's new. Today we sang two songs. But they're old songs. 
But in heaven, there's nothing like old. There's no feeling of old. Every moment, everything is fresh. Everything is new. Nothing. Oh, I already know this. So it's a mystery. Because we will be seeing each other. And what would we say? Long time no see? No. It will be fresh. It will be new. It will be wonderful. We have no idea what heaven is like. And Jesus came from that place. The only person to come to earth from that place. Jesus visited this place and he is bringing a message from there. The good news from heaven. The gospel. So this wine is fresh wine. It's new wine. And I believe some of us have tasted this wine. And it's so different from the old wine. The freshness of the gospel, the grace of God and how it took our whole attention away from ourselves onto Christ. What a rest, what peace, what assurance. But Jesus is saying this new wine must be poured into new wine skins. What is this new wine skin? Jesus is referring to our mind. So I want you to think about this beautiful comparison. What is the new wine? The gospel. What is the wine skin? It's our mind. Now Jesus is saying, the mind that receives the gospel must not be an old wine skin. Why? Because an old wine skin will not expand. It will burst. It will break. An old wine skin or an old mind means a mind that belongs to an old system, an old way of thinking. And in the context in which Jesus is speaking, he is referring to the old system of Judaism which cannot contain the freshness of the gospel. Old structures cannot support new life. The nature of the gospel is this. It demands a new way of thinking. You cannot think the old way and receive the gospel. The gospel demands a new understanding, new attitudes, new lifestyles, new habits. This is not something that I am just stating. This is my testimony. Because I am from the old system. In the old system, I used to judge situations and people according to a certain mindset. For example, I would judge people to be spiritual or not spiritual by their clothes. If I saw people wearing simple clothes, modest clothes, not flashy, not worldly, then I judge that person to be spiritual. And this was true for many years. But when God brought the new wine to me, I struggled. Because one of the things I saw, I saw certain people who I judged to be worldly because they were not dressed as I imagined a spiritual person should be dressed. But then I got confused because this person who appeared to be worldly really loved Jesus. And they were filled with God and, and I felt something is wrong. How is this person dressed like this and yet loves Jesus? My mind could not accept it. My mind was an old wine skin. I couldn't take it. So I remember several occasions when I had to make a choice. I must reject what I am seeing, reject that person as a charlatan. You are fake. You're pretending to love God. And I could stick with the old wine skin, my old opinions, or I had to let my mind expand. Like that, there were so many opinions I had. My church is the best church, the only church. King James Version is the only translation we should follow. 
Only consecrated pastors will have the highest revelation. This was my old wine skin, but God began to rattle it. God began to shake it. I began to see so many people have better revelation than me. I felt really small before the giants, but they didn't have what I thought was the highest consecration. And yet they loved God. There was something so beautiful about them, something so attractive. And I realized God was trying to do something. Jesus is telling us that if we must receive the gospel, we must first have a change in our way of thinking. So let us consider the gospel and the wineskin. The first one to bring the message was John the Baptist. And soon after, Jesus came with the gospel of the kingdom. But to whom did they bring it? They brought it to the Jews, especially the Pharisees, who both belonged to the old system. The Jewish mindset is an old wineskin that will never expand. The Pharisees would not expand their thinking, and so they constantly opposed Jesus. They could not receive the new wine that he was offering. They couldn't accept it. As Jesus began to pour the wine, and they began to see and taste, what did they find? This is an expanding wine. It was expanding beyond the Jewish boundary. The Jewish boundary, what did it say? Only us, only the Jews. All the non-Jews, the Gentiles, they're all dogs, they're rejected. But as Jesus was pouring the wine of the gospel, this blessing was going beyond their boundary. And it was touching the Gentiles, blessing the Gentiles. It was reaching out to sinful people. And the Jews said, no, it can't be. God hates sinful people. But this gospel is blessing sinful people. It touched that woman who was at the feet of Jesus. It touched the woman at the well. It touched the Samaritan. It touched the publican. The Jews did not like it. The old mosaic mindset that wineskin wanted the gospel only for themselves. And so as Jesus kept pouring this wine, the wineskin ripped and the gospel was wasted on them. So we have a problem. We are no different. If the gospel is so powerful, so radical, so life-changing, so shocking, why would Jesus waste that gospel in an old wineskin? Really, should not Jesus first give us a new wineskin and then give us the new wine? What do you think? Let me ask you. If Jesus just pours that new wine into this old bottle of my head, that wine is going to be wasted. So shouldn't Jesus first give me a new wine skin? And he has. That is why in the blessing of the new covenant, what does God say? I will give you a new heart and a new mind. Ezekiel chapter 36 Verse 26. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. He's not saying I'm going to give you a new gospel. I'm going to bring you the good news of my kingdom. No, this is a promise of the wine skin. A new heart and a new mind is essential before we receive the gospel. Then later in Hebrews 8.10, he says, Now I'm going to put my new law into their new minds. So this new covenant or the covenant of grace or the gospel was not something that happened suddenly. It was prophesied by Moses himself. And by Isaiah and Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and so many others. It was the desire of God all through the old covenant that he was going to give the new covenant. But the people were not ready. 
In the Old Testament, the covenant was written on tables of stone. But in the New Covenant or New Testament, it has to be put into us. So Jesus came with the new wine and he chose 12 disciples. Why didn't Jesus give these 12 disciples the new wine? If you read the Gospels, you don't find Jesus actually preaching so much of the Gospel. Very, very little. These apostles with him, they were called apostles. They were consecrated, they were set apart, they had given up their jobs, they were standing with Jesus. Why didn't Jesus give them the gospel? Because they still had the old wineskin. Jesus could not give it to them because they wouldn't accept it. They couldn't understand it. So Jesus had to die, rise again, send the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is the one who changes the mind. The Holy Spirit is the one that can give us that new wine skin. Now, I have been using a phrase for a while now. I've been saying change of mind, change of mind, change of mind. Do you know what change of mind means? So let me ask Brother Joshua. Can you translate change of mind into Tamil? Manamatam. Matam means turning. So use the other word for turning. Manam Thirumbudal. If I say Manam Thirumbudal in Tamil, how do you interpret it in English? Manam Thirumbudal is the word for repenting. The word repenting in English, we don't understand. When you say repenting, you think crying, feeling sorry. You, you have a different understanding, but the change of mind or the mind turning its direction that is the meaning of repentance. So the word in English for change of mind is repentance. The disciples of Jesus were with him, walking with him, listening to his words, watching his miracles, feeling his presence, praying with him, understanding his love. They even performed miracles. But something was yet to happen. A big change of mind was to take place. They had to Receive the Holy Spirit's operation to bring repentance. Some people think repentance is easy. A change of mind is easy. It's like maybe changing shoes. You know, I used to like black shoes. Now I, I've decided to wear brown shoes. Is that repentance? That may be a change of mind. But what I am talking of is not a small change of mind. In psychology, there is a particular word. How many of you have heard of the word metanoia? Metanoia is a psychological term. And I was studying this. It is rooted in ancient Greek. And it means a profound transformation, a deep alteration in our mind, or a fundamental change in our personality itself because of the way we think. One psychologist said metanoia means melting down and, and a rebirth. We go through a process of burning and melting down and a rebirth. Now why am I talking of metanoia? Can you guess? The Greek word for repentance in the New Testament is metanoia. In the New Testament, every time we come across the word metanoia, repentance, it's not just a change of mind. It is a radical, profound transformation, a deep alteration in the way of thinking. And this is not possible for a human being. This is too deep, something beyond what we can do. I remember talking to a Christian brother many years ago who died. You think, huh? You talk to a dead man. No. He died and he went to hell. He said his soul departed from his body and he saw his body lying there. He saw his own dead body and suddenly two beings came and gripped him and they were taking him towards hell. He saw the fire of hell. He heard the cries of hell. He saw hopelessness. He understood the 
the whole situation there, the, the feeling that he went through. And he began to weep. He, he realized he was going to be cast into it. But for whatever reason, God had mercy on him. His soul returned to his body and he opened his eyes. And when he was talking to me, this is what he said. Brother, after I went to hell and came back, I realized something. He said, the ability to repent is the greatest gift of God. We think repentance is small and easy. Go to hell and see. There is not even a desire to repent there. The ability to repent, he said, it is the gift of God. Now, why did he say it is the gift of God? Because it is a gift of God. If you read 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 25. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to See? the acknowledging of the truth. Peradventure means perhaps. He's saying, perhaps if God gives them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. That means you can't repent just because you plan to. Okay, I've decided at the end of this month, I'm going to repent. You can't do that. Repentance is granted by God. Repentance is metanoia. Metanoia is not a small thing, my friend. It is a profound transformation in our way of thinking, in our mindset. So, if you are even having a desire, I want to repent, I want to repent, that's a sign that God is already working in your life. This metanoia or repentance is the Holy Spirit working in your mind to remove the old wine skin and to give you a new wine skin to receive the wine of the gospel. So, can you see how repentance is a positive thing? Everything about repentance is beautiful. It is God's gift. And it's a new way of thinking. Repentance is something so precious. It is one of the most positive words in the Christian vocabulary. It is God giving you a gift of a changed mind. And it is free. Sadly, somewhere along the way, repent became a negative word. I told you of that young woman at the beginning. She desperately wanted to get back to church. She needed God. She, was, she felt she was dying. I need God. And not one of her sins could stop her. Not, not the devil. No one could stop her. But what stopped her from returning to church was the church itself. Because as she remembered the only memory of the church that she, she had attended was its theology. And the theology of the church was a turn or burn theology. Anyone knows what that means? Turn or burn. Can someone phrase that easily? Yes? Right. Turn or burn simply means if you do not change, if you do not repent, if you do not put your life right, you will burn in hell. I remember one man evangelizing in, in the UK. He used to walk down the streets and he would choose summer, summertime. And you know, summer in the UK can be very hot. People be fanning themselves. So he would approach them and say, do it faster, practice it because it's going to be much hotter in the place where you're going. What a way to present the gospel. So here is a woman whose life has come to a place where she desperately needs God. But her understanding is that if God must accept me, I must first radically change. I must clean up my act. I must go to church. 
I must now adjust and conform to the culture of the church, fit into the lifestyle of the church, and then God will accept me. What a wrong message of repentance the church has given the world. What is repentance? Repentance does not mean stop doing the wrong things. That, that stop doing the wrong things, that is the result of repentance. Repentance simply means a change of mind. You used to think in one way, but now you're thinking in a different way. Repentance is the most positive word in the world. Repentance resets your mind. You all know the meaning of reset, isn't it? Reset means you're now going back to the way the manufacturer made it. Repentance resets your thinking. In repentance, first of all, your thinking about God will change. In my repentance, it was so shallow and I, I would say so wrong. My earliest repentance had absolutely nothing to do with God. It was all about me and my sin and myself and fear of going to hell. But if you see what uh, we read in Acts chapter 20, the first thing that happens in repentance is your thoughts about God and Jesus will change. Acts 20, 21. Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God. You see, repentance is not about something. Repentance towards God. And faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. This is God's formula for salvation. Repentance means your thoughts about God will change and therefore you begin to trust Jesus. Repentance, if this begins the right way, secondly, your thought about yourself will change. You used to think selfishly, but now you begin to put others first. You used to have proud thoughts, but now you're thinking humbly. Earlier you used to be very ambitious, but now you're thinking, how can I serve others? Earlier you used to have self-condemning thoughts, but now you have grateful thoughts towards God. You used to think hate, now you think peace. You used to think worthless thoughts about yourself, but now you have a new identity in Christ. You have to change your way of thinking. Think about yourself in your new identity. If you are a Christian, it's not that you are worthy in yourself. When I went to a museum, I saw a broken chair. In a museum, there were things that were so precious. And here was a chair that was broken, but there was a red tape preventing people from going anywhere near that broken chair, not because they would sit on it and fall, but because it was so precious. A broken chair, so precious. Why? Because the queen had sat on it. You see, this broken chair belonged to the royalty, to the royal family. The chair itself doesn't have value. It's worthless. It's meant for the scrapyard. But why is it precious? Because of who it belongs to. You are that broken chair. You are worthless and you feel your worthlessness. But you have a new identity in Christ. You belong to someone and that's big. It's mind-blowing. Metanoia. Think differently. Don't say I am worthless. I don't deserve to live. So... Your thought towards God is different. Your thoughts towards Jesus is different. Your thoughts about yourself is different. And then your thought about sin will also change. The Holy Spirit is doing this work, changing the wineskin. You slowly begin to hate the things that God hates. And you begin to love the things that God loves. This is so beautiful when the Holy Spirit begins to do it. Because I remember before I experienced anything, I used to struggle. struggle. My greatest struggle was with myself because of the way I thought, the way I felt. 
And I said, God, it's too much for me. The standards are too high for me. I can't. I can't live this life. I can pretend, but I hated it. It made me so unhappy. I remember the day, probably around 20 years ago, when I said a prayer. God, you know who I am. You know how I feel. Can you change the way I think? Can you change the way I feel? And I remember about 15 years later, I looked back at that prayer and I said, I cannot believe what grace has done. Grace has changed my thinking and I am now thinking what the Bible is saying. So the Holy Spirit makes you hate sin and love righteousness. But this changed mind, it's amazing. It will immediately result in an action of the will. If the sinner honestly changes his mind about sin, then he will desire to turn from it and he will turn from it. The reason why we are not turning from sin is because our mind hasn't changed about it. We know sin is wrong because the gospel tells us sin is wrong. That's the new wine. But our mind, our wineskin mind is still old. We still like sin. We love sin, but we're trying to put sin away. The problem is that our wineskin is ruining the wine. That is why Jesus said we need a new bottle. Repentance, the change of mind, it will help us recover from deep feelings of hurt. Some of us, our mind hasn't changed, but we're trying to forgive people. How can you do it? You cannot forgive people because you want to. My friend, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. But for that, you first need a new wineskin mind. And this is what this poor woman needed to hear. I want to go back to church. I'm going to die. I need God. I don't care about what I have done. I want to talk to somebody. But why did she hesitate? Because of the theology of the church, the wrong repentance was being preached as something negative, as something fearful when it was the most positive thing. Of course, then people will raise the name. What about Jonathan Edwards? Did he preach the wrong thing? No, he preached the right thing. But to whom did he preach? The people to whom he preached were very hard, wicked people, and they needed to hear sinners in the hand of an angry God. It brought fear and repentance to them. But that's not the message you give everybody. Think of the broken woman weeping at Jesus' feet. If Jesus shook her shoulder and said, you're a sinner in the hand of an angry God, she would have run away. Think of the woman at the well. Think of Zacchaeus. Jesus told them to repent, but how beautifully repentance was positive and it was not turn upon. Think of the story of the Good Samaritan. He was dealing with that wounded man. That wounded man really messed up because he was making a journey from Jerusalem to Jericho. He represents a backslider. He was going down, going away from God. The Good Samaritan met him. And what did he do? He poured in the oil and the wine, and then he took him to an inn. That inn represents the church. The Good Samaritan is Jesus, and he tells the church, Take care of this wounded man, and I will come back. At my coming, I will come back. Until then, care. What is the church on earth? The church is a hospital for sinners, not a museum of saints. The church is meant to care for wounded people, but here the church itself is keeping wounded people away because of its wrong theology. So dear Christian, now that you have understood that repentance is positive, listen. If you are stuck in in your life in a certain situation, you are stuck. I I explain it this way. If you've seen a leaf floating downstream, you see it flowing with the current and then suddenly this leaf gets lodged in a stone or rock. So the water is still flowing, but the leaf is not because it's stuck in a place. What does the leaf need? 
someone to nudge it, push it. The leaf can blame the water, it can blame the rock, it can blame the weather, it can blame God. But what the leaf needs, what you need if you're stuck in a place, if you come to me and say, I don't know what to do with my life. I'm stuck in a place. I don't know what to do. I have, I have an answer for you. You have to finish it. You have to repent. I'm not saying turn or burn. What I mean is you need to have a change in your mind. The battle to change is won or lost in the mind. And in case you accept it, your next question will be, all right, okay, I have to repent. I have to change my thinking. What do I do? How do I change it? You can't change it. I didn't ask you to change it. You need a change of mind. It is the Holy Spirit who is going to do this. I will give you two verses which we will read in the New Living Translation. First of all, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Let the Spirit renew. What is the meaning of renew, anybody? Re. It's not just make new, but renew. It means it has gone. It's gone old. It's become invalid. It's expiring. It's, it's gone out of date. You have to renew it. Here he's saying the Spirit has to renew. Your, read that again. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. See, that means your thoughts have become old. Your, you are young, but your thoughts have died. Your attitude is very old, expired. So the, let the Spirit, he's not saying you do it. Let the Spirit do it. The Holy Spirit must alter your thinking until it aligns with God's will. I'm so grateful to God because I know who I am. I am by nature very stubborn and I would never let my opinions change no matter who. I would argue with people. But for me to be able to change my mind, I had to make a series of mistakes, wrong decisions. Everything I said, said went wrong until I came to a place when people asked my opinion, I wouldn't even open my mouth because... Everything I said went wrong. Then I was ready for the Holy Spirit to start changing my way of thinking. It was vital for me because I became helpless. I was that leaf, helpless, unable to help myself. I begged God, please change the way I think. Change the way I think because the way I think, everything, my attitude, every act, Depends on my thoughts. And God began to do it. Please read Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person. Okay. Do you remember the previous verse without looking at it? What's the previous verse you read? Let the Spirit renew your thoughts. Let the attitudes. Spirit renew your thoughts. And attitudes. And this verse says... Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform okay, you. Let, what is the word common in both? That says, let the Spirit do it. Here it says, let God do it. What is the meaning of let? A simpler English word that we know, allow. Why would I say, now for example, someone is giving you, and I say maybe a nice bowl of ice cream. You will readily receive it. Why would I say, please allow him to give it to you? Let him give it to you. Why would I say that? Because I am seeing there is some form of resistance. Paul is saying, let the Spirit do it. Let God do it because our nature is to hinder God. Our nature stops. But what must we do? We must make room. Allow let. This is so beautiful. If you read 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. 
The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. Okay, listen now. As some men count slackness, mm. but is long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should But that all should come to repentance. Come to repentance. Now, the Greek word for come is koreo. I studied this word and I was surprised. Do you know what koreo means? Koreo means make room for, give space to. In other words, if you have to repent, you have to give room for repentance. And this word koreo is used in other places in the Gospels. I'll give you one instance. In John 2.6, do you remember the story of Jesus changing the water into wine? The six bottles where the wine, the water was poured, the Greek word for that is koreo. It's a container. What is Peter saying? If we must repent, that is, if the Holy Spirit must make us change our thinking, we can't do it, but we must give room. So John, sorry, Paul is saying, let the Spirit, let God do it. Peter is saying, let your mind become a container because our minds are full of ourself and our opinions. But no, you let God put his thoughts, make room for repentance. So by nature, we are resisting the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will not force us. The nature of the Holy Spirit is to persuade us. Here is an important truth. The nature of every man is to resist God. We all resist God. But the Holy Spirit will keep working and working and working and persuading. And somewhere there, we find this making room taking place. And on judgment day, when God judges the sinners, he's not going to judge the sinner for every sin that he has committed. Because Jesus died on the cross for his sins. Jesus took that judgment. But the one reason why God will judge the sinners on judgment day is, my spirit came to you. My spirit was persuading you, but you resisted him. You resisted my, the kindness of my spirit who was trying to lead you to repentance. Beloved Christian, what you and I need is to give room to the Holy Spirit to change our thinking. It is serious. I really want the Holy Spirit. He is, thank God, I, I have so much faith in God because he has changed my thinking. But I need God to continue to work in my life. And we all need this. And this is why every day you must spend quiet time with God. As soon as you get up, you get out of bed, finish your chores, and get out of the house. You're busy all day. Look after your kids. Come back. You're too tired in the evening. Then you just go to sleep. You're young now. You have a long life. But one day you look back and you'll say, what did I do with my life? So please give room, choreo, give room to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now. But you give room during the day, during the week. Study God's word. Speak to God. Don't do what the old school teaches you. Don't say, God, hereafter, I'm going to do this. No, say, God, I can't. But I need you. Help me. Renew my mind. Change my thinking. The Holy Spirit is willing. But you should let him. Let the Holy Spirit do that work. So let us stop resisting God. Our nature is hard. Our mind, our opinions are strong. And some people are so hard and so strong. It takes several years. I remember when I was much younger. There were things that I was praying for and I got them seven years later, which other people were getting it overnight. And the only reason they were so pliable, so easily convicted. My hard heart and pride is the reason why I am experiencing everything so late. 
But at least I thank God for the mercy he has shown me. And I want us all therefore to have this understanding. Don't be scared of repentance. Don't think it's a negative thing. It's a beautiful thing. So let us stop resisting and let us surrender completely to the Holy Spirit. And may God renew our minds. Shall we stand? When I cross over Jordan and my work here is done, let my torch still be shining when my race I have run. When I see my beloved, I shall have no more fear. I will lean on his shoulder. I won't hold back my tears. I will lean on his shoulder. I won't hold back my tears. When I cross over Jordan and my work here is done, let my thoughts still be shining. When my race I for every word you spoke help us Lord because we realize we still have so much of that old wineskin because of which the wine is being ruined change our minds Holy Spirit as we yield let us be pliable oh we do not want to resist you with our stubborn thinking Please, O oh God, change us. Align our thinking with Scripture. We want the truth, O oh God. Please help us and help all those who listen to this word. Help broken people. Those who need to come to church. Those who need to find their Savior. Bring them, O oh God. And do this glorious work that all may know that repentance is a beautiful thing. And let this be the theology that we offer to the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord, Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with us all until Jesus returns in glory. Amen. God bless you.